Hello, everyone. This is number five in my new ongoing series on YouTube that I've called Jesus Archaeology for short. The idea that I have in this series is to take ancient historical texts, primarily in the New Testament, and material evidence, what we normally refer to as archaeology. That can be artifacts, that can be sites, that can also be landscape archaeology, the lay of the land, and what the situation is on the ground and under the ground. And by reading those together side by side and intertwining them, we can come to a better understanding of what we might responsibly say about Jesus of Nazareth in his own time and place. So today I have a really exciting discovery to tell you about that I was involved in years ago, and that is what we now call the Cave of John the Baptist. So what am I talking about? It is a cave west of Jerusalem, and I'm going to just illustrate it with slides and get into it right away because it's pretty intensive visually. Okay, so I'm calling this Exploring the Cave of John the Baptist, or as I like to say, John the Baptizer. That's really the meaning of his name. Yochanan Hamatvil in Hebrew, meaning John, the one who dips people in water. Now, John the Baptist is usually seen as a forerunner of Jesus of Nazareth. He appears on the scene briefly, gets arrested and killed, and points the way to Jesus. But actually, our historical records give us a much fuller picture so that John begins to have his own function and his own life, as we're going to see. And this particular cave might also be associated with Jesus of Nazareth, as well as John the Baptist. And I'll give you the evidence for that as we go on. This is the cover of Biblical Archaeology Review in 2004, November, December 2004, where this cave was talked about in a cover story based upon our work and research. And my partner in this discovery is Shimon Gibson. He's the one who called me about it and said a cave has been discovered recently on a kibbutz called Suba, west of Jerusalem, near Ein Kerem, a little village, and I'll show you all of those on a map in a minute. And he said, I think it has the earliest representations artistically of John the Baptist and maybe of the entire Jesus story represented pictorially. And I just couldn't believe the report that he gave me. I was astounded at it. But as he told me more about it, and I know him as a very reliable and careful historian and archaeologist, I wanted to sign on to the expedition. And this was in January of the year 2000. So you can see it's been a while now, but I'm going to update you not only on how we started, but what we know now that is just quite amazing and really fills in and informs us from that material evidence that we discovered in reading our historical sources, maybe in a new light and in a new way. So this was the cover issue. Notice the headline, John the Baptist, Has His Cave Been Found? Okay. So I want to mention two books. This is Shimon Gibson's book, my partner. We were both co-directors of this excavation. It was sponsored by my university, UNC Charlotte, and we had the license from the Israel Antiquities Authority. So this book that Dr. Gibson published, you can still get it, it's still in print, The Cave of John the Baptist, the very title of the lecture. It's very, very in-depth, extremely well-documented, and if you want to know everything about the cave, you want to get this book. This is my book that is a much broader take on what I call the quest for the historical Jesus, honoring Albert Schweitzer and the famous English title of his book. But in the Jesus Dynasty, I cover John the Baptist rather thoroughly. 
I include material on the Suba cave and weave it into a whole narrative presentation, which is my take on the Jesus, John the Baptist, James movement, as I call it, or for short, the Jesus movement. So I highly recommend those two. I'll put the links in the description. So let me begin with a couple of texts. You know, I teach a course on the Gospel of Mark, and many of you viewing this have had that course because we've had really good responses number-wise to that course. But here we have Jesus introduced in Mark chapter 1, verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now notice, it doesn't say where that baptism took place, just that it's in the River Jordan. Well, the River Jordan runs from north of the Sea of Galilee all the way into the Sea of Galilee and then empties out of the Sea of Galilee in the south, I'll show you a map in a minute, and goes all the way down to the Dead Sea. So somewhere along the Jordan, Jesus was baptized. And there are a couple of traditional sites, but I'm going to propose to you a site that usually is not considered. Verse 14, just skipping down a few verses. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into the Galilee preaching the gospel. And so here we have Jesus beginning his public proclamation of the kingdom of God. Repent, the kingdom is at hand, believe the good news. Now, what happened between verse 9 and verse 14? All that Mark knows is Jesus goes into the wilderness and is tempted, and then he comes back to the galley and begins preaching because John is arrested. Well, this is skipping quite a bit of time. Our best chronology in terms of what I've been able to uh, settle on is that the baptism of Jesus took place in the fall of the year 26 CE. John is then arrested early the next year, and then Jesus begins his preaching, trying to put it all together. Now, if you go to the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 22, you get material that fits in between these two verses. Should we accept this material? Is it historical or not? At the end of this presentation, I'm going to address this question. However, let me say this just at this point in the slides that more and more scholars who work on the historical Jesus are realizing that John, the Gospel of John, even though it's later and very developed theologically and therefore usually discarded in the past, that it has some very, very reliable material in it in terms of things that we can historically check. This is a very valuable report, and it's not one that John would likely make up. Notice, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the land of Judea, and he remained with them and baptized. What this is saying is that Jesus and John the baptizer teamed up. We know that some of Jesus's core disciples that later become part of the 12 apostles are disciples of John the baptizer. I even wonder if most of them were initially with John the Baptist. So it's a John the Baptist, Jesus, James movement that I have tried to trace in my academic career in trying to get at the quest for the historical Jesus. And by James, I mean the brother of Jesus, the second born of Mary, his mother. So according to this, there's a joint baptizing campaign I'm going to show you that John is in the north. John also is baptizing at Anan near Salim. We can locate that because there was much water there. It's literally waters. There's springs coming up all around the Jordan in that area. I've been there and seen them, photographed them. And people came and were baptized, for John had not yet been put into prison. So here, after John was arrested, this is in between, before he's put into prison. So what's happening? For a number of months into the fall and spring, and that would take us to the spring of 27 CE, according to John's chronology at least, 
Jesus and John are carrying on this incredible baptizing campaign, and they're both very successful. John later says that Jesus baptized more than even John, and then the editors add, but he didn't actually do it, only his disciples to kind of make him unique. But the basic story we're getting here is that Jesus is in the south, the land of Judea. That's down by Jerusalem. So where is Jesus baptizing down in the land of Judea? I don't think it's in the Jordan River. We'll see as we go along here. And John is in the north. Now, what about John? We also have a third source. If you take Mark, our earliest gospel, especially these special passages in John that give geography and chronology and some of the things that Mark doesn't know about, filling in some of the areas. And then you take Luke, the Q source, as it's called, of what we call the saying source, the collection of the teachings of Jesus. It's found in Matthew and in Luke in parallel, but not in Mark. So it's a unique source. We think it's earlier than the Gospel of Mark. And at one point in chapter 7 of Luke, it's paralleled in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says about John, what did you go out to see? A prophet maybe, right? He says, yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. So here he's saying that John is not just one more prophet, which would be really amazing, because the last prophet in the Hebrew Bible is Malachi. And he says, so you went out to see the new prophet, actually more than a prophet, because this is the messenger, and this is a quotation from the book of Malachi, who's going to prepare the way in the wilderness, a highway for our God. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, preparing the way in the wilderness. Now, Mark knows about that and talks about John doing that. But here Jesus is talking about the role of John. Now notice this. I tell you, among those born of women, there's none greater than John. Period. I think the original text was simply a statement. Among those born of women, there's none greater than John. This is a theological gloss. John has been edited in the interest of promoting Jesus and leaving John behind. So what's they don't take this out, this extravagant statement that the greatest human being ever born is John the baptizer, which obviously puts him ahead of even Jesus in terms of greatness. And yet this gloss, yet he who is least in the kingdom is greater, is like saying, well, if you're a Christian, you're even greater than John. Well, this is not found in some of our manuscripts. It's not found, for example, in the Hebrew Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew that we have. We have several Hebrew Matthews, but the one that I think preserves some of these original readings of Q and other material is actually uh, Evan Bohan, as it's called, the one that George Howard published. And again, I'm not going to get into all those details, but I think what we see here is that Jesus is saying John is much more than a prophet. John is the one who's inaugurating and fulfilling the messianic last days. Isaiah 40, verse 3, John's kicking that off. So starting with these three texts, these main sources, the Gospel of Mark, portions of the Gospel of John, and the Q source, we get an amazing composite picture. Now let's look at a map. We just read that John is baptizing at Anan Salim right here. This is the brook Kareth. This is associated with Elijah, and this is where John the Baptist often would retreat to hide from Herod the Great. He's later arrested, probably in Wadi Kareth, and he's taken down all the way to Machaerus by Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas rules the Galilee. Okay, now if we go up north, here's Sepphoris. And if you heard my previous video, I talked about the forgotten city, the hidden city of Sepphoris, and Nazareth, which is just a suburb of the greater city of Sepphoris. So if Jesus goes from Nazareth down to the Jordan, he's going to go down to the Jezreel Valley, and then it's just a straight shot 
and here's where you come out. So John has situated himself in the crossroads so that everybody traveling down from the Sea of Galilee or from the inland of Upper and Lower Galilee will funnel themselves right here where he's on the banks of the Jordan River and in the springs that are all around this area baptizing. So that we can locate. So what we then see in the text that we just read is that Jesus leaves this area and goes down into Judea to baptize. So this is down here and west of Jerusalem. Here is the marker for Jerusalem and Bethany and Bethphage. And Ein Kerem is right here where we're going to go, which is the birthplace of John the Baptist, according to our earliest traditions, right outside of Jerusalem. If you remember the story of Mary in the Gospel of Luke, she's up here in Nazareth, and when she finds out she's pregnant, she flees and goes down to Judea. And the way you would always go, not over the hills of Samaria, very arduous journey through these mountains, you would go down into the valley and down the Jordan Valley and then to Jericho and up to Jerusalem, and she would have then gone to Ein Kerem, which would be just about there. I'll show you clearly on a map. So you get the lay of the land here. You get the idea. Now, the traditional site of John baptizing is way down here. It's called Beth Arba and by other terms. And it's possible that John finally makes his way down the Jordan River. But where we find him baptizing when Jesus comes from Nazareth is right up here, according to the Gospel of John. Here's a close-up of what we're talking about. Notice the scale of miles. That is one kilometer right there. And here is the old city of Jerusalem. Modern Jerusalem goes way out like this. And to get to Ein Kerem, it's just a country ride of a few minutes outside of the main city of West Jerusalem today. And it's a quaint and wonderful place. And John is remembered all over the place. There's the Church of John the Baptist. There's a monastery here called St. John in the Wilderness, just a little further down the road. But the cave I want to talk about is right here. So if you head up the main highway and head on up, like you would go to the main road to Tel Aviv. Right here, you come to a crossroads, and you can go this way to Kibbutz Suba. So if you ever want to drive this, just go west out of Jerusalem. And when you come to this crossroad, take the left and go to Kibbutz Suba. And right here off the highway, as I'll show you in a minute, is this area where Shimon Gibson located this cave that he called me about and said, James, we might have the earliest Christian art ever discovered in the Holy Land. And I think that very well might still stand. We began to call it the cave of John the Baptist, and you'll see why when we begin to investigate it. Now, Kibbutz Suba, here's a picture. Suba means a swelling, and notice there's a natural swelling. This is not a tell. It's not an ancient city, although there's a crusader castle built on top of it but it's overlooking the main road coming from Jerusalem out of the hill country. And this is the hill country of Judea. We have in the Gospel of Luke, the account of Mary fleeing in haste to the hill country of Judea. And the hill country of Judea is the west side. The east side is the Judean wilderness or the desert. So if she goes to the hill country, she's coming to the west. And Ein Kerem is just over here. Here's that crossroad that I talked about. And if you take this highway here, you're going to go up to the kibbutz. You can see that bus right there heading up for the kibbutz. And this is the kibbutz. And it's called Suba for this landmark. And the landmark of the hill called Suba is mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. One of the men who followed King David all the way back to the Iron Age is called a Subaite, meaning he's from this region. And we have texts about King Hezekiah also in the Iron Age fortifying and developing this area with reservoirs and all kinds of vineyards and crops and so forth. So it's the rich area just outside the city of Jerusalem that was very inhabited. Now, you see this dirt road right here. If you stop in the highway, there's a fence here. And here's a dirt road owned by the kibbutz. 
and you go along here and just out of the picture here is where the cave is. So this is basically a road to tend to the orchards that are here. Okay, now here is Dr. Gibson and Dr. Tabor in our younger years and we're standing in front of the rock formation the bedrock into which the cave is dug. This is actually the corner of the cave, but you can see there are pools outside and this is bedrock. And this was all done in the Iron Age. It's a reservoir, a huge reservoir, probably dug by King Hezekiah, according to the records that we have in the books of Kings in the Hebrew Bible. So we had cleaned all the brush off and we had exposed this area. And now I'm gonna tell you about the cave. When I arrived, I had no idea what I would find. It was so exciting. I could feel tingling as I went into the cave. And this is the team that I brought. Dr. Gibson called me in January. I told him the fastest I could get there would be spring break, which was the first week of March. And I put together a team of my students. These are students that were taking my courses and other staff members. There's Dr. Gibson. There I am. This is Rafi Lewis, was also one of the supervisors and uh, eventually part of the license of the dig and other supporters. And so this was our team, a crack team from UNC Charlotte. These students were so hardworking and just amazing, and we were all excited. And the very first day, here we are eating breakfast and heading out for the cave. We had no idea what we'd see. We're in the hotel in Jerusalem. It's about 4.30 in the morning, and we're eating our box breakfast because the hotel staff isn't even up yet. And we were staying here at the YMCA Hotel uh, right across from the King David. Sounds like it might be slumming it, but believe me, the YMCA Hotel is quite nice. Here we are the very first day going on down and look at uh, the root. This is bedrock cut out of the solid bedrock. And look how it's filled up over the centuries with soil. We didn't know how deep it was. We had no idea what would be right under the knees and feet of as we started to dig. There's a little niche or alcove here. You can see how it's cut into the bedrock. Usually in a water installation, that's going to be a shelf. As you have this cut out with a shelf on down below. We weren't sure of that. We began picking away, and when we would swing the picks, they would actually hit the top of the ceiling of the cave. Uh, where do you see how deep it was? It's just astounding. Talk about a mystery. Uh, outside here, look, you can't see anything except just the ground level, and we're kind of crawling into the cave, and the entrance is just over a meter. You have to kind of squeeze in. This is one of my students and she's at that ground level that you just saw. And look, over her shoulder to her left is the image of John the Baptist that Dr. Gibson called me about. And I'll show you better pictures, but look, you can see his little head here and he's got his arm up and he's holding a staff. You see the staff right here? And he's got a little vessel here, perhaps for pouring water on the head. We know he's immersing, but this was done in the Byzantine period, so maybe they have a vessel like this. We see that in some of the Byzantine art, where Jesus is in the river, and he's going to dip down, but you also pour water over his head, maybe as a ritual or an anointing, so to speak. And there's his little legs, and his, uh, you're going to see much more of him. But what I want you to notice now is where he is. Depending on how deep this cave is, He's up in the air at some point, and we can walk up and just see him eye level. And that's what was discovered by one of the people on the kibbutz who called Dr. Gibson, and he called me in Charlotte, North Carolina, and said, you got to get over here with your students. Let's find out the cave of John the Baptist. Why is his image? We know he's from Ein Kerem, so it makes sense that he would be the image but uh, what is this cave all about and what was its history? You're only going to know that by digging, by excavating. Now, remember I told you about that little niche? 
and we've gone down probably about uh, almost a meter and we're hitting we're getting to a new level or new surface see how the color changes and all of a sudden i don't know if you can see it you're getting bits of roman pottery early roman pottery from the time of the first century ce from the time of jesus we couldn't even believe it i mean we thought if the cave is full all the way and it's a pretty deep cave which we thought it had to be this huge water reservoir we could see how far back it went and i'll show you pictures of that in a minute then it's going to be full of ottoman material and byzantine material and crusader material and maybe at the very bottom there might be a bit of roman material from the time of jesus and here we are not even a meter down above that shelf and we're finding all of these pieces of roman pottery now get this it was on the last day of the dig spring break you get off a week and you can add up two weekends to that and you can kind of turn it into 10 days and we found this Roman pottery on the last day. We were scheduled to fly home the next morning, back to school, back to classes for Monday morning, Tuesday morning classes. Guess what? I called the chancellor of UNC Charlotte, James Woodward, and he knew all about this. I was in touch with him. You know, this was the first kind of archeological expedition of students from UNC Charlotte in the Holy Land that had ever been done. So there was a lot of excitement on campus. What are these students going to find? And I said, Dr. Woodward, believe it or not, on this last day in the morning, we have buckets and buckets of pottery from the first century. We couldn't even believe it. It was astounding. And I said, it, would it be possible for us to stay another three or four days and be excused from classes? And he said, take another week, which we did. So we dug for two weeks in March of 2000. Then we returned in the summer. Same group, we added a few more students to the group. But those students that first went, boy, they were loyal. They turned their whole summer into this because they didn't want to miss out on what we're going to find. So it got very, very exciting. Now, these steps you could not see. You got to picture the soil to see where we are. You got to picture the soil. Here's that entrance. So if you picture it going across like this, like this, see, and right across here, the shelf is still a ways down, but right here at this level, probably about right here, we're already finding that Roman pottery. So that means that a huge amount of the fill, maybe we didn't know how deep, from down to the ledge itself is going to be first century, which puzzled us because, again, I, I thought we would find much later remains, certainly Byzantine and Crusader and then Ottoman. I mean, the Turkish Ottoman Empire was there for 500 years. Wouldn't it have been filled up uh, during that time? Well, as it turns out, to make a long story short, uh, Well, as it turns out, when we really got the whole chronology of the cave, there's a huge amount of activity that's going on even in the first century, early Roman, and then Byzantine. But sometime in the later Byzantine period, and that would be fourth, fifth, sixth centuries, the cave went out of use. So the additional material that accumulated wasn't so much since you were already at this level. So this is a picture that Dr. Gibson drew to show us what we thought was most likely the Byzantine level. And we're beginning to get these steps going down, but there's going to be more steps as you go on down, you'll see in a minute. This is bedrock. This is cut out of the bedrock. You'll see a picture of it later. And it's got a place for the foot and it has to be the right foot. You can't fit your left foot in it. I've tried it. And then there's a little basin and it's inclined with this channel so that if you pour a liquid into the basin, it runs down over the foot. It's some kind of anointing ceremony. We'd never heard of it. And here you have a picture of somebody with a little juglet pouring most likely some sort of anointing oil over the foot. And then the water, 
you would go down and be baptized. And then there's a little fire hearth here, and there's an opening at the top of the cave that can allow smoke to go up and not fill the cave. So these jugs, this kind of jug, we found fragments of thousands and thousands of pieces of this jug. Now, if you're coming to a huge water reservoir and you want to carry some water, you're not going to carry a jug like this. You're not going to carry a little handheld jug like that. Uh, and then all of these jugs are broken. So there's some ceremony, and we still don't understand exactly what it is, that probably you're anointing your feet with oil, I would say, the right foot, and then you're going into the baptism maybe some rite of baptism that also included the anointing with oil. And there are texts about, I will put forth my right foot in service to the Lord and so forth. So we speculated that it might be some sort of symbolic ritual before somebody's baptized as a ritual of dedication. Often in early baptism, you would take your old clothes off and trample on them and put on new clothing, and then you would dip yourself in the water. But this just screams to us some sort of ritual activity. And the ledge, you could put your clothes on. Here's that actual bedrock. You can see uh, only this part would have been shown in that drawing. And you've got the uh, little basin for the foot and the place where you would hold the oil. And this is the kind of uh, vessel that we found thousands and thousands of fragments of this vessel. So probably what's happening is the foot is getting anointed, then you're baptized, and then you break the vessel and leave it there. The only thing we came up with, because there's so many of these vessels, they're not cooking in this cave. They're not eating in this cave. We didn't find any evidence of that. We did what's called flotation to see what might be in the debris on the different floor levels. This is not a cave that was inhabited by anybody. It's filled with water much of the winter months and all the way through the summer. And it's fed by a spring that we found up at the top. So this just, again, shouts ritual. And why would you break the vessel so that it would never be used for common usage? Now, look, when we got all the way down, there's the picture you saw in the drawing. There's that basin. And we're going on down with more steps. And uh, look, we also found these steps outside. So steps outside. Remember when we first crawled in, we were right here. And all you could see was that. And we didn't know it was a step. And then you've got these beautiful steps going. And then more steps going down. So that when the water is up to this level, you could go down the steps and be able to draw water. Now, this would go all the way back to the origin of this reservoir, the Iron Age. And indeed, this is plastered. All the walls are plastered, plastered, plastered all the way back. The roof, of course, doesn't need to be plastered. This is the natural bedrock. So there you get the whole picture. So the John the Baptist image is right here on the wall. This is the little incense area. And you can. this is the floor of the cave. And we left this for future analysis. By the way, today, all of this has been removed all the way back to the back of the cave. And all of this has been taken out because we just wanted to preserve it for these pictures. Eventually, we removed it. We dug steadily through the years uh, up through 2006. And then in 2008, we finished everything up. When I lead archaeological tours, I like to bring people to the cave of John the Baptist. It's quite exciting. And it still works. The water still flows in, still fills up. I think I've got a picture here. You can see how the water has come in. There's your rock where you would do the anointing. And this is filling up. This is before we took out the whole backside. And this is up on that ledge going back and seeing how far this has all been removed now all the way down to the floor so you see the whole cave i'll show you a drawing at the end so here's what the entrance looks like today you can see we've cleared it all out this is also plastered the steps are plastered going down into the cave 
And this is an area that's built in modern times to keep any collapse from going down and filling up the cave. But you can see how beautiful the entrance is. What an amazing facility, probably built again in the time of King Hezekiah. Now, very important picture. If you go all the way to where we stop, the gentleman is standing right here against this wall. So he's not even going all the way up. So notice this. This is so important. At the very bottom, we do have some ancient material, but very little, not even a few centimeters. And then we've got some late Hellenistic material. And then, and, and these are floors, each, each season as soil would build up, if it wasn't cleaned out, you would have the soil building up. From here to here is early Roman. That is amazing. You can see that that's like almost two meters of material. And then Byzantine and early Islamic, and then a little bit of Ottoman. The cave basically goes out of use right here with the Byzantine period. This is in the first century. Early Roman, we define as the period of Herod the Great down to the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. So this is first and very early second century. This is the time of John the Baptist and Jesus. So the cave was being used extensively in the time of John the Baptist and Jesus, and not to live in, not to eat in, but to carry on probably some sort of baptizing rituals because of the juglets that we're finding. Very, very interesting. Here's a close-up of our John image that you only saw before in a different light. Uh, let me point out some features. Here's his hand raised up to proclaim. Here's his staff. So he's like this. Uh, this is some sort of a little vessel, we think. And then this was probably for a relic a relic, maybe a piece of a bone or something that was in here. It was empty. But in the Byzantine period, we know relics of John the Baptist were collected in this area. Notice he's got his hacked garment on. The New Testament says he wore camel's hair, so there's an attempt to share that. His hair is bunned up into a big swirl because he's a Nazir, a Nazarite, most likely. That's the tradition. So he has to roll his hair up in a big, huge bun. The face has been chopped away, possibly by different rival religious groups, either Christian or later Islamic, that didn't want to have any kind of graven images. We're not sure of that. So he looks kind of funny with this funny nose, but somebody's been chopping away at him. By the way, in Jerusalem today, I've met a few people that are... Nazarites that are doing the Nazarite vow and they've grown their hair very, very long and wrap it up. And it looks very similar to this. It looks like swirls of hair wrapped up because you can't let it go all the way down to the back of your legs or something. This is on that left side as you come in, you saw from the early pictures. But on the other side, the right side as you come in, if he's in the hill country of Judea, and it is the home of John the Baptist, and the family of John the Baptist is living in that area. It might have been the base of operations for the baptism campaigns of Jesus. I don't think he went into Jerusalem and did his baptizing. He seems to be in the countryside, in the hill country of Judea. So he could have been in this very cave. And can I prove it? Of course not. But it's just wonderful speculation, and there's some more evidence. So now let me give you an overview of the whole thing, because I know it can be confusing. So this would be before we dug, you come down and you squeeze into the entrance right here, and you don't see any steps or anything. And these are the Ottoman period remains. Here are the Byzantine remains. Here are those early Roman remains. And look at the steps. See the steps? So we uncovered all of this was removed, and that was Ottoman period. And then we went through the Byzantine period, and that's where we found some of our installations and so forth. There's John just kind of peeking his head a little bit above the Ottoman remains. <laughs> this is a shaft that allows light and water to come in. And there's a spring up here that feeds a trough that goes down into a shaft 
So during the winter, this fills up with rainwater and rainwater is considered clean for ritual purposes. So in the first century, this was being heavily used because that's where you find all of that pottery. So perhaps people are baptizing, breaking the vessels, leaving them behind in some sort of a ritual practice. Now, this is really interesting. This is a clay medallion. It's celebrating the flight of Elizabeth and John the baptizer. See his little halo and there's Elizabeth. And here is a Herodian or Roman soldier trying to grab her by the shawl and stop her. And right here, you can't really make it out in this particular medallion, but we have another one that's a very similar scene. And this we think was found at Ein Karim of all places. And it's got these steps, look, the steps going in and then the steps going down and then across and something maybe representing baptism. So this is Byzantine, but it's being remembered. Have you ever thought when you read the Gospel of Matthew, you've got this legendary story, whether it's historical or not, that Joseph and Mary had to flee to Egypt to save themselves from the troops of Herod the Great, who's killing all the newborn babies like ancient Pharaoh in the time of Moses. And so that's in the Bible. So if it's in the Bible, the Byzantine Christians certainly think it's real. So they have imagined, well, where would Elizabeth and John have gone? Because John's not killed. And they live right there near Jerusalem, just a few miles west of Jerusalem. You know, we have a number of texts that we call the infancy gospels. They're just uh, pseudepigraphal texts. Uh, we don't know who wrote them. They tend to be usually second, third, fourth, fifth century. But the earliest one is called the Proto-Evangelion of James. And it seems like the creator of this medallion has this text in mind. So I've got my little friend who is going to help me read the Proto-Evangelion of James. Okay. So this text would probably date to late second, early third century. And when Mary has to flee to Egypt with Joseph so that Jesus wouldn't be killed, we have this paragraph. But Elizabeth, when she heard that John was sought after, this isn't addressed in the New Testament. It's pretty logical. If Herod's going to kill all the babies two years old and under, then that would include John. She took him and went into the hill country. Notice we're talking about this very area. And she looked round to see where she could hide him. And there was no hiding place. And Elizabeth groaned aloud and said, O mountain of God, receive a mother with a child. Isn't that interesting? O mountain of God. You saw that Suba mountain that she's probably calling the mountain of God. For Elizabeth could not ascend, and immediately the mountain was rent asunder and received her, and a light was shining for them, and an angel was with them. And Herod was searching for John and sent officers saying, I'm looking for John and so forth. And so the tradition develops from that, that she went into a cave, and that's what you see represented in these Byzantine medallions. Isn't that amazing? And I've got another screen I want to share with you. Okay, if you go to my blog, you can see here jamestabor.com. Easy to remember. Please subscribe. Uh, you can go to this blog. You get a free newsletter. You can go on down here and subscribe where you get notifications. I'm posting on it all the time. There's an amazing amount of material here, but that's not what I'm talking about today but it has a great search feature. There are hundreds of posts on this blog, all kinds of topics. So I typed in here, as you can see, Mark and John, and here's the first thing I got. So you can go to my blog and get this and read it. Priority does not mean primacy, the gospels of Mark and John. And in this article, I'll click on it here where you can see it more fully. Uh, I discuss how I think it makes good historical sense in terms of method to read our earliest account, Mark, but also include 
the narrative portions of John, not all the theological speeches, the red letter material that's very, very high Christology and very developed and probably much later, but the chronology and the details that Mark knows nothing about, particularly the geography, the travels, the chronology, and absolutely the last days of Jesus, the last week of Jesus, where the writer of the Gospel of John, or I should say the writers, because I think it's a group of people, and they talk about that at the end. We know this is true and so forth. And they get it from a witness they call the disciple whom Jesus loved who I think is James, the brother of Jesus, but that's another topic. So if we go back to the main screen again, you see I did a series of posts. You'll get these if you search Mark and John. Reading Mark and John, uh, reading Mark and John, reading Mark and John, reading Mark and John, John and Mark. So look at those, dig in yourself if you're interested in this. You can study a little bit more and explore uh, these headings up here, I've got so much material here. I would call this blog my nerve center for all of the other things that I do. You can see the YouTube and some of the other things are here as well. So I'm going to stop the share. So the cave of John the Baptist. Well, it is identified with John the Baptist by the drawings. But, you know, if Jesus is baptizing in Judea in the south, and everything's focused on the west side of Jerusalem, the hill country of Judea. And that's where the springs are, and that's where the water source is. Where are you going to baptize? If you're baptizing crowds of people, you need a big area to baptize in. And, you know, I cannot prove that the Suba cave is the place, but boy, does it fit the idea and that first century ceramic evidence that's found, almost two meters of evidence from that period, shows the cave is being intensely used for ritual purposes, but no evidence of any kind of habitation. And it would have mostly filled up with water at that period. You saw how the water would go all the way to the steps in the early Roman period. So, you know, it's a great discovery. It's a wonderful thing. We had such a wonderful time digging there and imagining and so forth. So I want to also mention to you that Dr. Gibson and I and Rafi Lewis, Dr. Lewis, were all planning to bring out our academic volume on the Suba Cave this year, 2024. And it will be published by the Israel Exploration Society a wonderful publisher of archaeological books, and it will cover all of the physical evidence. I'm writing one of the articles on who is John the Baptist and what do we know. It'll survey all of that and all the material evidence, and it'll be available for anyone to read and see what we discovered during that nearly a decade of digging the cave of John the Baptist. So I'm going to leave you with that. And I want you to look back and read and think about some of the things that we've covered and let them sink in and get a good map and figure it all out and maybe get Shimon Gibson's book and get my book, The Jesus Dynasty, if you're interested in learning more. Take care, everyone. See you next time as we continue to delve into some more Jesus archaeology. Get your blood flowing. <laughs>